This podcast episode is brought to you by OWC, Whisper Room, Spectra 1964, PreSonus Studio One, and Jay-Z Microphones. So get ready to rock. I love Nashville, um, and I love living here, but the the idea of the three, three hour or four hour session is a killer. It really is. It's some of the players here are mind blowing, and it's like, well, I've only got you for four hours. How can you expect the, the magic that happens in the studio? in four hours. Complacency kills art is really what it comes down to. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. If you feel like the fast pace of computer tech has made your Studio Mac obsolete, then think again. OWC is your personal studio tech for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and use Macs perfect for recording and mixing. Why ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with the Mac you've already got? Learn how to supercharge your studio and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC.com so that you can focus on making great music. If you're sick of bothering the neighbors when you're trying to record your music or ruining your recordings with outside noises, but you're not ready to spend a fortune on permanent studio construction yet, then consider getting a Whisper Room ISO booth for your studio. Whisper Room offers an instant solution for a comfortable, quiet, ventilated, portable ISO booth with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booth when you mention Recording Studio Rockstars at whisperroom.com. Hey, Rockstars, it's Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Howard Willing, a Nashville-based engineer, producer, mixer, previously from Los Angeles, where he made records for 22 years. He was also A&R at Capitol Records and has worked with an amazing list of artists, including such fantastic names as Sarah Bareilles, Linda Ronstadt, OK Go, Cheryl Crow, Dean Martin, and Scarlett Johansson, Glenn Campbell, Counting Crows, American Idol, Liz Fair, Smashing Pumpkins, Mute Math, Van Hunt, Tupac, and Snoop Dogg, among many others. Um, also want to give a big shout out and thank you to Brad Wood for making our introduction. I'm super excited yes, yes. to have you in the studio with us today, Howard. Please welcome Howard Willing to Recording Studio Rockstars. Are you ready to rock, dude? I'm ready. Welcome to the studio, man. Um, I haven't really had much to say about you know who you are other than I know you have an amazing list of people that you've worked with. But tell us in your own words a little bit more about who you are. How'd you get started out in recording and end up in Nashville, Tennessee? Mm. Uh Oh, it's 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 a really easy story. I uh, I was a really bad student in college, and uh, good place to start. Yep, and uh, I had a, a friend who was going to a a recording school that I will not mention, um, and said maybe you should check this out. And it was a year course, and uh, i i took the I took the course, and uh, that was it. When was what's in. what city were you in? Where were this, you growing up? Well, if I. Well, okay, so it would have been in Orlando. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I just oh, gave man. away. I, I gave away the school. I believe. Guesses so, go and go yeah. now. Yeah. Um, well, so okay, great. So you went to do, do a recording course. Were you like way into music before you decided that you were? It was time to do a course in it. Well, uh, way, way. Well, way into music is, I, I guess, since I was a kid. I guess would be the easiest thing to say. I've I always loved music and. You know, I'm old enough to have, uh, you know, records and go through the records and was really interested in who made the records and uh, kind of had weird ideas about what each of these people did. And, you know, just, I don't know, it just made me really super excited to, uh, to, th to think about how all of these people's ideas came together to make a piece of art, yeah. basically. Were you um, playing an instrument and stuff like that? Was it, were you a musician I, first? I was. I, I, I'm primarily a trumpet player. Um, nice. Not not too much anymore, but 
was a trumpet player, played uh, French horn, saxophone, um, did some violin and some cello for a few years. Those are all hard instruments. Violin, I know from experience. Saxophone, I know from trying for like five minutes and my <laughs> lip hurts so much. Um, and I did play a little trumpet as a kid. Yeah. But um, those are those, those require a, an element of <laughs> perseverance, I, right? I loved playing it and was, I think like a lot of us, got super into jazz when, you yeah. know, when I was in my younger years. And that was the only music that I could listen to. Um, cause it was the only real music. So are we yeah. talking like early nineties or something like that? Uh, it would have been the eighties. Eighties. It okay. would have been the eighties. Cause when I was in you know, high school or teenager, I kind of, uh, issued, uh, rock and roll and all that stuff and got into, I got into bands that like, you know, I'm happy to say I'm into now, but back then you would, like I was into Toto and Chicago, like wow. I was into, like I was into earth, wind and fire yeah, and you, bands that used, you know, brass instruments or, you know, that, that type of stuff, yeah. because that was, that was super exciting to me. And big arrangements. Big arrangements. Yeah. All that Maurice Starr kind of stuff. Um, all that earth, wind and fire stuff was huge, huge, huge stuff for me. I guess the big arrangement stuff comes from, you know, growing up playing horns where everything is part of an arrangement a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. I wonder if people who grow up playing guitar care about big arrangements quite the same way. I th it depends, I think, on the on the on the kid, right? Yeah. I mean, you you kind of um, I work a lot, and I'll we'll probably come back to it a bit. I work a lot with the, the Smashing Pumpkins, and Billy's into big arrangements. I mean, just everything has a place, and everything's harmonically driven, you know. There's 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 a reason for everything. Yeah. And uh yeah, it's it just depends on I think it really does depend on the kid and and a lot of it has to do with the era. I think if you grow if you grow up listening to like a lot of different styles of music and you get really super excited about it all, you can kind of see how all the pieces fit together. Um it's kind of like a Bowie thing in a way. Yeah, I agree. The more I learn about music, the more I appreciate arrangements. Yeah. Because some of them are just mind blowing. Listen to any of that back rack stuff. You just like I, I sit there and I listen to that stuff. I'm like, how do you even think? Like, how do you think to do to do this type of stuff? Um, any of the early Billy May stuff with like Nat King Cole and like all of that kind of stuff. I, I just don't know how they the Nelson Riddle stuff. You know, all of that type of stuff. It's just really, really amazing to me. Um, are you an arranger yourself? No. I, I I think like a lot of guys, I, I'm kind of like, oh, this will work better here. This will work better here. So it's just kind of that that cut and paste kind of mentality of, you know, how to make things work. Yeah. Well, I mean, we can talk about uh, working with Billy Corgan now some, if you want. Uh, the, you know, the nature of a lot of the Smashing Pumpkins records is a quality of many layers of arranged guitars. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's a quite a variety of, of styles of approaching a record now over sure. over a whole discography. But um, talk a little bit about that. I mean, what, what are you guys uh, excited to be working on today? Well, you know what? You may have to be a bit more specific with okay. me for that because, um, you know, pr our prior conversation before we started the podcast was about Im impressionistic kind of stuff. And really, that's kind of how he views things. Right. It's not... It's not like, how do I explain this? A lot of times when you're producing or engineering with somebody, if I have a guitar player here and I say to them, let's, this part needs something kind of stonesy, right? They'll play Brown Sugar, right. Right? Jumpin' Jack Flash. Like, literally. You know, it may be a variation or whatever. And that's not really what I want. You know, I want the impression of that. And I, I want the excitement of that. Or I want the, you know. Another word I hate, the vibe of that. Um, <laughs> but uh, Such a useful word. It's, it is. It, it, fits, <laughs> it, 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 it works for everything. Um, you know, it's just, so I just, I, I need a bit more of a, a direction in terms of like how you, you know. Uh, okay, it, yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, you know, honestly, we love hearing any story about working with Billy and, the, and Smashing Pumpkins <laughs> and pretty much any story from you. But, um you know, if you've worked with Smashing Pumpkins 
um, earlier and you're doing stuff now, um, maybe talk a little bit about some of the things you learned about layering guitars on earlier records. Um, I've certainly heard stories about things like Billy talking about like, you know, uh, lay a guitar and don't retune before you double and stuff like that, you mm-hmm. know, just, just various studio lore. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, I, I can't speak for Billy, obviously, uh, just knowing what I know is like it's it's definitely evolved over the years mm-hmm. in terms of how he's approaching things. Like I worked on two records, two of the what what are called the classic records in the in the nineties, Adore and Machina. And then yeah. subsequently produced a record for them, Monuments, and, and I'm now working on a, another record with them um that I'm just engineering. Uh so I I I got to see Billy, you know, in his kind of, um, his, it's not that he's, he was more focused back then. He was just way more had like, he's one of those guys that has a sound in his head. So he, he won't stop until he gets the sound. Yeah. You know, it's, it doesn't matter what it takes and it doesn't matter how long it takes. And that's one of the things that, uh, you and I don't really get to do much anymore. Like you, we don't spend six hours on a guitar sound anymore. Yeah. You don't have the luxury for it. He has a place, he can do that, you know? And, and, uh, I do know that we tune a lot. (laughs) I do know that, uh, we try a lot of things, you know, I, this, this record that we're working on now, you know, we, we would have full arrangements, everything built up we would l- literally tear the whole thing down, literally everything, and rebuild it again. Um, the same kind of, like going for the same thing, just to... Maybe, maybe it needs to be a bit faster. Maybe, maybe the impression of it is, isn't quite giving him what he wants. Hmm. You know? And that's, it, that's our whole job, right? It's to get the artist off. The yeah. artist gets off, somebody else is definitely going to get off on it. Right. You know? And... Um, yeah, I mean, as as to the process, it's just it's it's trial and error. You know, I can't you can't sit there and say, well, if you do this, do this, do this. Oh, it's the Smashing Pumpkins, but it's in the hands, it's in the guitar, it's in the day. Yeah, you know, it's all of that type of stuff. Well, how about sharing with us just kind of a fun memory of a, um, a unusual configuration you guys might have done for a guitar or, or mm-hmm. something fun with mic and up amps? Anything come to mind with that? Well, uh, mm, no, because, it, you know, it, we spend so much time, like, we spend so much time getting the tone. <laughs> How do I put this? It's not fun. It's not a fun memory. Right. Because, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean that. I don't mean that in a bad way. It's, just, it's like, uh, I would sit out there, you know, in front of a guitar amp while he's playing stuff, moving things literally millimeters Wow. With headphones on, find that spot. Okay, mark that spot. That's the spot for that 57 on that speaker, blah, blah, blah. All right, let's get the next mic. You know, it's it's that type of stuff. Yeah. It's definitely not, you know, the kind of throw it up and go. But guess what? We love that stuff here. I I love doing it. I, I love doing it. My I, I, I will say, and if you go on, if, if you, I'm not, and I'm not plugging my Instagram, but if you go on my Instagram, you may <laughs> see some pictures of stuff like this. Like one of the things that I picked up from Billy was he worked with Roy Thomas Baker mm. on on a on a record, and Roy did this thing on the um, with with the bass cabinet, and he he was running SVTs, eight by tens, and he would literally take C12s and four one fours, and put them maybe a centimeter off of the the cones. So like they're angled in, but there'd be like five of them around one single cone. Wow. Right? Um, and then we we took, so you have you have four to five microphones on the one cone and then you feed them all to different preamps. So you're getting different colors there. No compression, none of that type of stuff. And then you just kind of like per the song, you may kind of just change the blend a little bit differently, but it gives you this weird 
immediate kind of like hyper focused uh, bass tone. It's yeah. cra- it's crazy. It's and that's a, that's an RTB thing. I can't, I can't take any credit for that one. I like it, an RTB thing. Yeah, but that stuff's super cool. So that that does involve having a console and some faders in front mm-hmm. of you potentially where you can sit there and sculpt the sound a sure. little bit with the faders. Then it's like, don't touch it, right? Uh, no, we, t- we touch things. I mean, it, it, nothing's precious. That's nothing's, great. Nothing's precious. And, and if it's something that works for one song, especially, and again, this is more so with this particular band, something that works for that song for, for one song will not work for another song. So you can't, you can't just say, here's your rhythm sound and then go. You have to be, it's, it's very song specific. That's great advice. You want the critical details from your microphone to get through to your recording and the Spectra 1964 101 amplifier provides just that. With unequaled headroom, low noise, and a linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks. Used by Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, and The Record Plant on records by ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, and John Lennon, Spectra 1964 brings that same incredible sound to your studio with the new STX 600 mic pre with built-in comp limiter. Start making classic records again at spectra1964.com. If you want a digital audio workstation that will give life to your music from sketching a new idea to composing, editing, mixing, and mastering a finished record, then you want Studio One from Presonus. Studio One is easy to use with intuitive drag and drop simplicity, making it great for beginners yet flexible and powerful for experienced producers. Whether creating beats, recording a band, or composing a blockbuster film soundtrack, you will find everything you need to create your masterpiece. Download your free version of Studio One Prime and get started now at PreSonus, wherever sound takes you. When you're talking about being on the amp, moving it incrementally with headphones, um, I know it's hard work, but it does make me think about the value of doing that process and some of the challenges with actually figuring out how to do that process. So let me ask you the dumb questions like, what headphones do you put on? Is it so loud that it's killing you while you're out there in front of the amp? How do you how do you manage some of those things? How do you communicate with Billy so that you know when he likes it, right? And he can tell you. Uh, well, a series of hand signals, and you know maybe he'll just chunk the strings. That's, we do the right? chunk, chunk. You just chunk the strings. <laughs> um, but the headphones, uh, I I think at the time were I want to say the Sony's, the super loud bright ones. Oh, the 7506s? Yeah, yeah. Um, which I don't really recommend for anything else other than that. Um, Andrew Shep says he mixes on them well, all the I time on a laptop. How the hell he mixes on those things? I think I think we all just, it's like you said with guitar tones. It's, yeah. It's the same thing you, doesn't work for every song. The same yeah. thing doesn't necessarily work for every person. Really? I can't believe he uses those. But it sure is good to know yeah. and hear stories about what does work for different people because it gets, yeah. you, gets your wheels turned. My favorite, and I plug them to everybody are the Sennheiser HD 650s. Oh, nice. I um, I I like the, uh, oh, I use the Biodynamic 770s. Those are great. Those are really good too. But the but everybody I've turned the uh, the HD 650s on to loves them. They're open back. Yeah. Uh, they don't get super loud, but they're very, very even. And you like those if you're out recording or you like those as an engineer? I like those for modern. singers and I like them as an engineer. Okay, cool. Note to Lidge, pick up some of those for the studio. Um, well, that's cool. So then you've got a pair of headphones on. So it's got to be pretty loud where you're sitting it's out pretty, by it's, the amp. It's loud. You're beating yourself up for a minute. Mm, yeah, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, at a time. But it's that's what you do. Yeah. That's what you do. Well, it's valuable. And, and being willing to um, commit to getting the sound and giving yourself a chance to hear what those differences are when you move a mic a little bit. Well, there's that. And I think a lot of what uh, doesn't happen these days is I don't see a lot of uh, younger guys going out in the room to listen. Like, so if you have a drum kit, they just kind of put their mics up and they go. They don't have the drummer sit down at the kit, play the kit. All right. So now I know kind of totally what I'm dealing with because obviously you go into the, the control room, you're, it's totally different. You know, so at least I have you have a base point. 
if right. you're, you know, if you're listening in the room, and I, and I mean that about guitars, you know, um, all that type of stuff, you know, do the one ear, you know, do the one ear with loud uh, uh, rhythm guitars and stuff like that, you know. What, what tell us about the one ear with loud rhythm it's guitars? Just, you know, you just plug up one ear because you can't, so that you're kind of hearing the one, you know. So you're not fooled by the stereo exactly, quality the stereo, of your ears. the stereo image of it. Which, yeah. of course, of course, everything sounds 3D when you're standing by it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I, I'm totally down with that about listening to the instrument out there. Um, sometimes it's hard because at first I think you don't know what you're hearing or you don't know how to trust what you're hearing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what can happen, too, is you can have a vision for what you think would sound cool coming out of the speakers. But when you learn to go in and listen to the instrument, you discover... Oh, it doesn't actually sound like that out here. So maybe I need to get it to sound like that out here before I can hope for it to sound like that in the right, control room. Right. Or, or you know, acoustic guitar. Maybe you need to choose a different microphone. Maybe a large diaphragm isn't correct. You know, maybe you need to go with a pencil. Maybe you should, you know, stereo mic it. Maybe you should have a room mic off of, you know, to kind of give you whatever depth you're looking for. What are some things that we might listen for as differences between a large diaphragm and a pencil mic on an acoustic guitar? Well, first thing is you're going to get a lot more low end out of large diaphragm. Um, and, I, and that's, uh, that's, that's a huge part of, it. I think, you know, you're going to get a way more focused kind of center top ends, depending on the microphone should be a little bit smoother on a large diaphragm. Again, you know, if you're using a 47, it's going to, it'll probably sound beautiful. Um, but, uh, these days, I tend to the uh, the AT fifty forty fives, which are the side address small diaphragms, and then I use like a two fifty one or forty seven, um, and just do kind of like a spaced pair on them. And that way, I get the that way I can blend in kind of like that low end kind of hump with the kind of what we know of you know the kind of Nashville kind of really direct um, acoustic sound brightness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So interesting. So the AT is sort of the bright, and then mm -hmm. the the um, what was it, two fifty one or two fifty one, or you know, it it can be an eighty seven. It doesn't have to be a just it, just, a just a large diaphragm that isn't too bright. And when you were saying space pair, you you know, uh, rock stars can't see your hands move, oh. but you're sort of holding your hands out, uh, yeah, as if it was maybe on sort of on either side Three of the feet, guitar. Right? Or so you have else. the you have the 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 small diaphragm kind of up at the twelfth fret kind of normal position. And then the the large diaphragm is kind of, I don't know how to explain it, but it's over here. If, More if on I'm, the bridge side of yeah, the guitar. Yeah, but, but kind of facing towards maybe the, the, the back side, you know? And then sometimes I'll actually move that over so it's like right in front of the sound hole. Right. Depending on what I want. You just have to make sure that you don't mess up face. Right, too right. Much. When you say facing towards the back side, do you mean that it can see the the... The curved side of the guitar yeah. as well, yeah, yeah, where the strap is connected, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Right, and then so, how do you know if you're messing up phase? Well, phase switch is always a good thing, but you, I think you can, it, you know, pulling them up, you'll start to hear uh, frequencies start to mask and go kind of crazy. Um, I don't know how to explain that other than it's kind of like a you know, it's a learned thing. Yeah. Um, are you, uh, you know, as a starting place, should we maybe take these two mics, put them together in mono, and then just put them next to each other? And then that's so where the phase switch you're, helps. You're smarter than me. <laughs> no, no, I, just like, I just like breaking it down. I mean, honestly, I, See, I, 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 don't, I don't think of, I, I should have said, I don't think of like that as like, I split those. Like I, they would have already been up the center because I don't, unless it's just a, a singer songwriter, and I kind of want to get a little bit of a spread. I don't really like spread acoustics that way. Right. So we're not going for a stereo. I, yeah. Sound, I, it would so. be a mono. It would be a mono thing anyway. So I should have, I should have said that to begin with. But kind of like miking a drum kit, we're we're sort of combining mics to create to capture different sides of a you know unified sound. Right. Right. And I'll almost always have a room mic. On an acoustic guitar. Okay, cool. Almost always. Just crushed um, through something nice, you know. Nothing that's too grainy, you know, like maybe like a Fairchild or, you know, something that 
just imparts a nice kind of— Yeah, I got a, I I a spare Fairchild sitting around. <laughs> we, well, we all have one in the box somewhere. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, that opto kind of thing. So yeah. even a distressor would, would work well. But, um, and that's usually, uh, I would say that's eight to 10 feet back. Okay. Um, and, now, does this count mostly if you're in sort of a, a bigger, a medium to big room studio? Or if you were in a home studio, would you still get away with eight to I, 10 feet back? Well, it depends on, obviously it depends on your studio. But, you know, I, I try to have room mics for almost everything. Almost everything. I find that um, a lot of, de- you know, a, a lot of things we search for, the height and the depth and the width comes from that. Mm-hmm. So, like, even if you just feather stuff in and it's like, it's not super noticeable, but you take it out and it's like kind of the mix or your, you know, whatever your sound is, it kind of goes, it just kind of goes a little bit flat. Right. Um, that's That's all I'm looking for. You know, I'm not looking for giant changes. I'm looking for subtlety and kind of like, you know, a nuanced kind of sound. Yeah. And would you find yourself to often um, bringing these together on a console and then capturing them into onto a single track, a mono track in Pro Tools, for example? Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any preference about having three different tracks in Pro Tools and, and trying to like Strike with, the balance and then hold on to it versus just ca- you know blend it ahead of time. Right. So with that, with that type of thing, an acoustic, I prefer to have it split out. If I was doing an electric guitar, I don't want. I think like a lot of guys, I don't want five microphones on. You know, and I'll take the five microphones down to one and a room mic. Yeah. But I don't want all that split out stuff. It just it doesn't. I don't know what to do with that. Yeah. Because you're not making a commitment then. Right, right. And it's kind of a pain in your ass later. (laughs) Right. And with an acoustic, it's like, you know, again, you know, if I'm not mixing it, I want to be, like, if I hand it off to you, I want to be able to say, so here, like, here's my acoustic guitar. And you'd sit there and you'd be like, okay, I I really need this to be bright. I don't need this low end. Or I kind of want to, you know, get it nice and tubby and, you know, I don't know how you're going to sculpt that. So, you mean if somebody else mixing it later? Right, right, right. I don't want to lock you in on harmonic instruments like that. It's like it's like having a piano and only giving them the hyper compressed piano. If that's what you're going for, that's cool. But if you're not sure where that's going to end up, you should give them the clean and a hyper compressed. All right, I'm so glad you brought up piano because you, I, you'll have to um, clarify what your role was in it, um, but you were, were part of making one of the best piano sounds on a pop song I've ever heard, which is Sarah Bareilles' Love Song. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about, you know, any tips you have for getting a great piano sound that cuts through on a pop track. If you want to comment on how that one came to be. That'd be great. Sure. But it really is one that when I hear it, I'm so struck by how exactly right it is for that song and how surprisingly different it is than I might have instinctively mic'd up a piano as just if I was just miking up the piano, not knowing where it was going to go. Well, uh, first off, my really good friend Eric Ross produced that record. He's he's best known, obviously, for Sarah Bareilles, but also did Tori Amos. Uh, Anna Nalek, uh, Gavin DeGraw, bunch of bunch of stuff. He's he's amazing, an amazing musician, amazing person, and really great producer. So he uh, he approached me um, and said, I, "I'm I'm doing this project. I'd like you to to engineer for." And he's like, "Why don't you come down?" And I wish I could remember the club, but I went to with him to see this girl. You know. Uh, play with her band. And you were in LA at the time. We, I was in LA at the time and we went down and listen, you know, the rooms, you know, semi-packed and listening to, it, I'm like, wow, okay, this is pretty cool. And, um, you know, we just kind of talked and he's, it, we had built up a, 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 a relationship that like, he knows what I do. So it's not like he had to come to me and say, 
okay, I want this to be super dry or I want this to be really punchy. I want this to sound like a Beatles, you know, any of that type of stuff. He's just like, just do what you do. Like hiring the right guitar player. For exactly. He, he, he cast, he cast the engineer basically. So, um, we went to NRG studios in the, I think they call it the Moroccan room, but it's the room in the back. It's, it's not the big, big room. Um, and man, I wish I could remember who played bass on that. Um, but we had Matt Chamberlain played drums. I think Brian McLeod played some drums on it. Um, obviously, Sarah played the piano. Um, and the piano was really simple. I took, I, I took a modification of something that Eric did because if you listen to those first two Tori Amos records, they sound, the piano's awesome. Um, he had these B&K microphones. I think they were 4077s. Awful with the numbers. We had one firing maybe hmm, two feet off the, the top hammers. We had the other one firing backwards. So it's not firing towards the low, you know, the low end of the piano. It's, it, it's firing towards the strings, not towards the hammers. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so, so, so yes. So, so it's kind of like that kind of thing. So there's a... But they're spaced apart. Yeah. So I don't know how to explain that. So to how many mics total? Three or four? One, two, three, technically five. Technically five. Right. So we had the two main, which were the B and Ks. Um, and those are sort of like in a, one's looking to the left, one's looking to the right, a little bit of the hammers or something? No. The, so the, let's call it the, the top string B and K is looking at the hammers, mm -hmm. maybe about two feet off. The, the low string ones are, it's firing in the other direction. I see, okay. So it's looking at the strings, but basically in the same plane. Right, right. Right. Okay. Um, I then put uh, a 47 or a 48 on the low strings as well, just on the back end of the piano. Right. Looking forward towards the hammers or just sort of straight uh, down at the probably, strings? No, looking down at the strings, yeah. And then the biggest part of that sound is I took a pair of Royers and— I did basically, how do you say, is it Blum? Blum oh, Blum line would be the two figure eights. The yeah. Blum line. Um, it, it was either a Blum line or I just took two, <laughs> two Royers. <laughs> I, that part of it I can't remember. It's all right. But, but, but I do remember that it was, you know, it was through the Neve board that they had there and then absolutely hammered through the, uh, are they 2254s? Yeah, the, the, um, the classic Neve. kind of. Neve compressors. Compressors, yeah. And there are even some good plugins of those now. That, there's some great ones of those. But that's uh, that's the sound of, of the piano on that. And of course, her she's she's a great player. Yeah. Now, where would those, um, where do you remember the Royers being? They would have been, so at the, you know, the piano kind of curves. Mm -hmm. So they would have been just outside, but like just over the lip. Right. Just kind of looking over the lip. Just kind of like like looking over the lip, but getting that kind of like hyper present, but also still pulling in the room sound because it was compressed so much. Yeah. Um, and that's, I mean, if you took those out, it just sounded like a really nice piano. Interesting. But you put those in and they, they kind of did that, you know, jacked kind of thing. Do you remember anything about the stereo-ness or panning approach to getting that piano sound? Just left, right. Was it probably like a hard left, right? Hard left, hard thing? right, yeah. On both so ones. cool. So cool. Yeah. I love that. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Easy. It was all right, great. So so I just need to get all those mics, get the piano, <laughs> get the room, and then ask Sarah to come over and play on the next record. And then it's and then it's done. <laughs> and of course have Eric and you there. Well, Eric, you don't really need me. <laughs> we already got you. I'll get yeah, Eric on the podcast and we'll just get all his secrets too. Thank you for sharing that. Probably, oh, then one other thing, probably copious amounts of EQ into the compressor. Right. On the, uh, pro and probably quite a bit of low end, to be honest. Added. Added. Wow. I was going to yeah. think maybe we were cutting the low end or something to get the mids to punch through. Well, probably, if, if I remember what I was doing in those days was a lot of that, um, adding a lot of that two to 600 area. So, so that lower mid kind of thing and just, 
pushing that really, really hard. But the, the womb frequency. The womb frequency, yeah. Because uh, you're a tape guy. So, like, you know, back in the day, we used to know part of our romance with it was you used to know how hard to push the tape so that she would get that mm. kind of out of it. And that's, that's kind of that bloom that happens when you hit tape just right. It kind of like, it saturates the top. You kind of get that thickness thing that happens. So with digital, obviously, because that record was done uh, to, to, to professional tools, we, uh, <laughs> we, uh, I, I figured this is what I do to kind of, to kind of get that thing. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. You know, we, I use tape, he says, sitting right next to the tape machine. <laughs> Are you sick of microphones that make your music sound harsh and brittle? The new Amethyst mic by Jay-Z Microphones brings you a rich, warm tone with perfect detail using the Golden Capsule technology. Resulting from 30 years of microphone design, the Amethyst is hand-built using carefully selected parts with Class A discrete circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and an advanced shock mount to make sure you're recording sound awesome. This is my voice on the Amethyst right now. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the Amethyst mic at jzmic.com. Um, how often are you using tape these days? Uh... Not often, but on with again with the uh, with the pumpkins, a good amount, a good Great. amount. Yeah, we we did this thing and we kind of recorded all the drums to tape and digital at the same time. In the end, digital won out, um, mainly because of you know the records that you need to make today need to be really snappy and transient, right? Um, and doing the drums to tape kind of saturated it a bit too much and kind of didn't give you the same excitement. Mm. But then we, with all, the, with all the other instruments, not guitars and not vocals, so any keyboards and that type of stuff, we would run uh, tape and digital at the same time and record them both and then kind of choose. So I would say, you know, at this point, it's maybe 50% of the things that we've done to tape have made it. As, as the actual sound on the record. So you've got a couple of sounds. You can decide which one you like better and run with that one. Right, right. Um, what's a process for running tape and Pro Tools at the same time? What are some, just, just some basic elements of like, you need to hook it up this way to get that to work so that you can actually do this? Right. Well, so basically what you have to do is you have to f figure out what your offset is for your tape machine because you're running everything off the repro head. So... Once you figure out, you know, it, it's, I know for, for the machine that we're using, it's 16,820 samples. Um, because I recorded, I, you know, I record the digital along with it in, in repro. You guys, are you recording at 192? 96. 96. Okay. 96. Um, so it's recording. So I, I get, some, you know, like play, you know, play a snare or whatever. Bam. I have my transient. And then I can just kind of go through and measure the the distance between it, and then basically when you're when you're recording, you just monitor the digital, because um, otherwise it would be you know flammy and you know all of that type of stuff. And then you just shuffle, easy peasy. Can I help clarify that a little bit? Sure. Um, so if it sounds like you're doing the same thing I'm, I would do here, uh, you take the sound. So you've got a snare mic; it's coming in. You split it somewhere so that you can have the snare mic go directly to a track on Pro Tools, but you can also have the split go over to a track on the tape machine. Right. Then the tape machine's recording, but it's in repro playback mode so that it plays back a moment later off the tape head. That goes into Pro Tools on another track, which right. is muted right. while, you're, while you're recording. And then after you record the snare in, then you can look at your digital one, you can look at your tape one and your digital one, and you and you shift the tape and one earlier out, yeah. in time yeah. to be synced yeah. up with the with the digital one. Right, such a great thing. I love doing that. I love doing it too. It's time consuming and it eats a lot of hard drive space, but uh, it's it's interesting to hear the difference. Yeah, it really is because because the other great thing is you you can really try to push tape at that point in time. So like you can oversaturate it or you know kind of pull it back and just kind of use it as an effect. 
So true. Um, a lot of times I, I still sort of really try and get a good alignment on the tape machine mm -hmm. before I do something like that. And then I leave it there. But you do have the option to just go in and just start fucking with the alignment on any one of those tracks because you can listen to it, what's coming back off the tape. Um, it will be a delay. And if the musician is hearing it at the same time, that can throw them off. Sure. But it's like, it be, like you say, it becomes an effect and you can start messing with like, what happens if I crank the bias this right. way or that way or really gain it way up or whatever. Right. Yeah. And that, that's, that, that's the interesting thing about using some of the, like the ATR plugins and the, the uh, 800 plugin that uh, UA makes is you can do all of that. And it, it does a pretty good representation in, of that. Yeah. In real time and yeah. really hear what it's doing. Yeah. I remember Steve Albini talked about being able to bias a line of tape machine by ear if you want. And I was like, how do you do that? And he said, you do it, you listen, and it sounds like a box of rocks or something down low <laughs> as you're adjusting it and you like find the sweet spot. I was like, wow. And so I'm like intrigued to try that with the tape machine. Listen, like, okay, I'm recording a snare drum. Where does it, where's the box of rocks while, I'm, while I'm messing yeah. with the bias setting? Only he could do that. Um, very cool. Do you have any um, fun tape alignments you want to share with us? Do you like 15 ips, 30 ips, or is it like everything else where it's just appropriate for the record? It's, it's what's appropriate. I, for rock and roll, generally 15. Um, 15 plus 4, 456 back in the day with Dolby SR was kind of the, my jam. Nice, man. Yeah. Loved it. Um, Can we... Get that in Pro Tools. I mean, can we get that in Plugin Land? Does that exist? Yes, you can. You actually can. Um, I don't. I know with um, the the eight hundred plugin. Obviously, you can do. You can do a, a four fifty six emulation. You can do a plus four alignment. You'd have to obviously go in and manually align it yourself. The Dolby thing would be tricky, but you can use a, a plugin. There's a plugin that called Satin, I believe. And it does encoding and decoding. And here's an extra tip. If for some reason you're working on um, tracks that were cut back in the day and you can't find a Dolby SR or, or a Dolby unit, Satin does a good job of doing the, uh, the decoding, which is really cool. Really? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, it doesn't do a great job, but it does a good job. Not to put you on the spot, but do you remember who makes Satin? UHE maybe or okay, something right, yeah. one of those. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I don't remember offhand to be honest. That's cool. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure we can just Google it and find that, it. And that is a. If you're a tweaker, it's a great plugin. Like you can totally make something crazy with Satin. Really, it's it's a you know it's a tape emulation plugin, but you can change biases. You can choose, you know, all these weird tape formulations. It lets you screw with. Um, you know, the wow and the flutter and the, the uh, like, head gap width and all of that type of stuff. It's a really, really cool plug-in. Very cool. Um, 15 nips plus four, 456. I remember when we shot out different tape formulations, we, we had the luxury of doing this once at Sunset Sound, and we tried a bunch of stuff. And I remember just feeling like 456 just sounds like old-school rock and roll mm -hmm. to me. It had this mid-range crunch to it that I liked. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I like. Um, you, you know, you're talking about if you want to get tweaky with it and you talked a bit about, you know, Billy taking time on finding a sound in the studio until he's got it versus what we get to experience in other ways. Do you have any thoughts um, you want to share more on finding ways to allow ourselves that experiment time in the studio? Do you Have you found ways to work with clients that don't typically have that kind of budget of time and maybe money? For record, but still find a way to include it and make more interesting records. Wow, that's like the <laughs> tough uh, question. That, that is a tough question. Um, I haven't, and 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 I'll say this because ultimately it hasn't come down to whether or not I want to do it. It comes down to kind of like how how the industry's moved, and uh, a lot of people don't want to sit around and take that time to do that type of stuff anymore. Um, I love Nashville um, and I love living here, but the, the idea of the three, three hour or four hour session right. is a killer. It really is. Um, there's some of the players here are mind blowing yeah. and it's like, 
well, I've only got you for four hours. And you may say, well, that's enough time. But it's like, how do you, I talked to um, Tim Pierce, who's an amazing uh, session guitar player. And we talked actually about this a bit. It's like, how can you expect this kind of, the, the magic that happens in the studio in four hours? You know, if you, if you don't allow yourself time to come back, reevaluate, you know, redo things. Like, tear it be, down and rebuild it. Like tear it said. down and rebuild it. You know, a lot of it's, uh, complacency kills art is really what it comes down to. And, and um, I'm not trying not to be a downer, not to be the get off my lawn guy, but it's like we've become really complacent with our art. Another great quote from you, by the way. <laughs> Get off my lawn. No, well, that's a good one, but <laughs> complacency complacency kills art. Yeah. You Earlier you said uh, nothing's precious. No. No, you can't. How can it be, right? It's uh, the amount of times that I've, I've if I've produced a song, um, I, I work with this girl, uh, Katie Cole, and she would come in and we'd have this song and it'd be, Oh, this is great. You know what? Let's do this just as a straight ahead kind of like, you know, Nashville kind of shuffle. And you do the song. It's like a week later. It's like, you know, Katie, this isn't right. Let's, let's redo this song. Let's, let's do it. You know, I, I want to do mariachis on this one. <laughs> wow. And so it's like, okay, well, and, you know, so you kind of come up with the concept of that. You do it. It's like kind of, no, that's not right. You know what? Let's do this as a really stripped down kind of like just you and a couple of guitar players and kind of like have a sonic kind of like Eno-esque Lanois kind of soundscape. That's it. No drums, just this, this, this. That's, and that's the, the thing. And it's hard to find artists that will, um, it, it's not that they won't allow you to do that. It's just to, 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 to have the courage to allow you to also go through a process of finding something in a song. And you weren't going to plug in your way to that solution with the very first tracking of the song that had happened. Right. Well, you, you know, I mean, I guess you could, you know, you could just remove the drums, but you'd have, you'd have the artist singing to like kind of a shuffly drum take with like whatever kind of bass and all of, all of that kind of stuff. It's like, well, yeah, but it's not, that's not the art. That's not, I don't know how else to explain it. That's yeah. not the color right. that I want right. you know, out of this. Um, any more comments you want to make on impressionism in music? <laughs> what does that mean to you? <sighs> uh, hmm. Or what do you like about impressionistic art? That's a better question, I think. Uh, for me, at least. Uh, it, it kind of allows me or the listener to impart their own version of the art into it. Um, I, I don't know how to explain it's, it's It's a feeling. It's a feeling. It's a color. It's a... I don't know how to explain it, Lidge. Just, uh, You're doing fine, though. It's good stuff. And I like that you've, you just said the artist or the listener. Yeah. Well, there was a, my, one of my favorite quotes was by Seal of uh, he, his second record, um, which has, I think, Kiss from a Rose and a bunch of other great, amazing songs on it. But the production on it is insane. Um, no lyrics. And I, I remember reading a, a, you know, a, 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 an interview and he's like, why don't, why don't you print the lyrics? He's like, I want, I want the listener to have their own experience, which I thought was kind of actually a beautiful thing. So there's lyrics in the song, but just not printed. In the- he just didn't print them out. Right. And, you know, because it, 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 it was the early 90s and it wasn't the hyper detailed vocal tend to be louder than everything that we have now. Yeah. You know, maybe words got lost or whatever, or maybe he mumbled some words through it. But, you know, so you can kind of have your own interpretation of a lyric, which I think is kind of, uh, that's, that's beautiful, I think. Yeah. Or it leaves room for MTV to divulge to us what the lyrics actually are like they did on <laughs> Smells Like Teen Spirit when you're like, like a mosquito? Yeah. Well, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, you look at that, you're like, what the hell? 
Very cool. Yeah. Well, let's take a break for a sec and uh, we'll come back in for the jam session. Before we go, Rockstar, as a reminder that we have links to what we're talking about here with Howard in the show notes. Just click through. Um, and I've got a nice playlist of videos together for you to go click and listen to a bunch of these great records that Howard's done. Amazing stuff, dude. Really excited to have you here. Thanks. We'll see you guys in just a minute for the jam session. Do you really want the neighbors banging on the ceiling when you're trying to rehearse or record your music? Do outside noises and computer fans get into your studio mic and ruin your recordings? You could book a pro studio to record every time, but that would add up quickly, and doing permanent construction to soundproof your studio could easily cost up to $100,000. And you can't take that with you when you eventually move the studio. Don't you wish there was an easy solution right now? Whisper Room ISO Booths offers a simple way to install a comfortable, quiet, ventilated ISO booth in your studio with easy line of sight for recording vocals or even drums in a variety of sizes. For 30 years, Whisper Room has been solving studio isolation needs with ISO booths that are shippable, portable, and can be assembled in an afternoon. Now you can get pro vocal recordings right in your home studio. Practice whenever you want and start using real guitar amps again. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booth when you mention Recording Studio Rockstars at whisperroom.com. If you're using a Mac in your recording studio and you're tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly, then Otherworld Computing is the solution for you. OWC can help keep your existing Mac and studio current and relevant so that you can make great music. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac, you can get the most mileage out of your studio with OWC. Offering a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49, there's no need to get frustrated when you can achieve the speed to create and the capacity to dream at OWC.com. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Howard Willing, and we're going to jump into the jam session, the second half of the show, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to keep calling it the jam session because you got to call it something. It's the jam <laughs> session. You ready to jam, dude? Yeah. All yeah. right, cool. Um, you know, you were talking a moment ago about this this you know process of being willing to try something, throw it away, try it again, throw it away, try it again. And, you know, you consistently have great sounding records um, and great sounding results in your discography. So is part of the message a little bit that the path to something that is really great might just simply involve making something that's really bad first? Absolutely. Do we have permission to go make bad stuff? Now? I think you should make bad stuff. I, you know, my, the early part of my career, at least, I made a lot of bad stuff. Um, not purposefully. I, I tried. Um, you know, and then you have those aha moments where it's like, oh, okay, that's what a compressor actually does. Right. You know, it's like, oh, that's weight. I'm too much of an attack on that. Ah, if I let that breathe, all of a sudden the acoustic or the snare opens up and it's like, now I get it. Um, but yeah, you've got to, you got to be willing to fail, I think, um, to be a great artist, to be great at anything. You got to be willing to fail. Yeah, we were also talking before the interview a little bit about how the fast-paced nature of sessions and the world of plugins maybe has guided us all towards, we'll, we'll just kind of capture everything in clean because mm -hmm. we'll mess with it later. Yeah. Versus, uh, you made a comment too about how sometimes it's you go the, too far the other direction, which is you try and get more experimental and then you just end up with, you end up starting with something that's all just a bunch of crappy sounding stuff. Right. And <laughs> it, you want to elaborate on that? Well, that, I think that just, that's, that, right? that's um, experience, right? So, you know, when you're kind of, well, that's a bit too much kind of meant, you know, kind of thing. It's like, you know, if I, if I mangle this thing into something, well, then where do I go from there? But if I back it off just this amount, I can always, you know, push it a, a hair more. Um, yeah. It, it again. It depends. There's like there's there's uh, one record I I I produced. Uh, there's this 
what song was it? It was a song called uh, Get Over It with OK Go. Yeah, OK Go. Yeah, talk and, about um, those guys. And <laughs> well, I, I remember, I just remember doing this. I mean, I, obviously I did the whole record, but I remember we were tracking the solo in it. And that solo sound, I, I wish I had written it down, but I do know it was run through nine different pedals. <laughs> Nice. And, and I remember the guitar player, I think, I think it was Andy, like he would pick the guitar up and it would just start, feed, it would just, it was crazy. Like, he's like, how the hell am I going to play this thing? And he did, you know, we, after, after about, you know, probably four hours worth of working on it and tweaking it and continuously tweaking, we, we got that guitar tone. And we got for that just the solo? For just that solo. How long's the solo in the song? 15 seconds. 15 seconds. Maybe. Maybe. That yeah. is really, really great permission. So I can't count the number of times where a musician might apologize to me for having taken too long on a part. And, you know, maybe we took an hour or two on mm -hmm. something and I'm like, dude, that was fine. You know, that was, if we weren't, if it wasn't challenging, we weren't trying hard enough. Well, you know? Absolutely. And they, you know, they, they have to, I try to make people know that that's okay. You know, take as much time as you think you need for it's your art. Yeah. You know, you and I we're we're kind of like the uh, the conduit. You know, we're the they come in with the idea, we're the people that like if we're if we're the engineer, the producer, whatever, we're just kind of like trying to capture the that that moment, that fleeting moment. Um so they should, they should be allowed to screw up and try everything that they want with, eh, within reason. Right. I mean, you don't want to sit, you don't, uh, again, part of the thing that comes with experience is that like, we know that certain things are not going to turn out the way that you want, you know, th that an artist may want it to, you know. I don't have any specific things, but you you just drums. You just know. It's always drums. Yeah, or it's vocals. drums or it's yeah it's something. It's like well, it's not really going to turn out the way you want it to, you know. Um, so trust me on this, you know, yeah. kind of thing. I do feel like drums is one of those places where you need to save a lot in reserve now for the finish line of the mix. So, for example, you may envision something that's got a lot of compression and a mm -hmm. lot of whatever, but you're going to desperately be glad that you've got that uncompressed version of something later on Absolutely. to make the mix work or whatever. Absolutely. You know? and, and as I, you know, any countless people have said, print stunt mics with a bunch of whatever on it. EQ the living hell out of it, compress the living hell out of it. But just make sure your kick, snare, overhead, and, you know, maybe a mono room mic are clean. Right. Know, not, not hyper tweaked. It's, a, it's kind of amazing. I was watching some... Uh, because I still love learning and I still love seeing, I, the thing I miss so much about not being in studios every day for weeks at a time is that I don't like, I can't just walk down the hall and see you tracking it, you know, tracking a band and, oh, what is he doing over there? What, you know, what's going on over there? Oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to run back to my room and try this. Yeah. Can't, you don't really see that much anymore. Where right? did, where have you seen that? Well, I saw it, qu you know, quite extensively when I was coming up and I, my main studios were were Sunset Sound. Um, great place. Yeah, I mean, great, great, the greatest. It's the the best. But you know, like when I when I would work over Capitol, you know, I could go, you know, Al Schmidt's across the hallway mixing something, and Al would just wander into the room if he heard something, you know, and he'd be like, "Oh, what are you guys doing in here?" You know. So it's like I miss some of that. So the great thing is, is that YouTube and all these other things allow you to kind of see what other engineers are doing. Yeah, I agree. Right? Um, you, you, you have, yeah, of course. It's not me, <laughs> it's you. No, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, I was struck, I was watching something and I'll, I'll, I'll say who it was. It was Eric Valentine. Eric Valentine. Who's He's awesome. I love Eric stuff. Crazy, crazy talented guy. He was doing a, you know, a, a drum thing and he, he showed the before and the after. And I remember reading the comments because I was like seeing what, what um, you know, people think about how things turned out. And there were a number of comments of people saying, 
now I can be, stop beating myself up over the fact that my drums don't sound like, you know, the, these r- songs on these records. Because Eric showed, I got a great drum recording and it sounds kind of meh, sounds kind of boring and flat. But he took it and sculpted it into something that was way p- more punchy and everything. And even he was like, this is what my drums sound like when I track them. Mm-hmm. You know, I just kind of mix them after the fact. And we're, we're too much is spent on trying to make everything sound like, you know, some hyper realized version, you know, especially in the tracking stages. That's my rant. Well, that's my rant. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, what about in the land of vocals? So, for example, I remember discovering um, even the concept of triple compressing a vocal, mm-hmm. and then we started tracking them all like that. Um, how do you think that that makes sense? What What is the balance of doing enough treatment to a vocal during tracking, but still leaving that final, you know, sure. 10 yards for the mix or whatever? Well, I... And I'm gonna I'm gonna drop a name. Um, so I was talking to Bob Clearmountain because I'm lucky enough to have done a number of records that he's mixed. And we were just talking about Mike, you know, because if you're gonna hang out with God, you got to ask him a few questions, right? <laughs> so I, you know, I would just ask him, "What do you do for this? What do you do for that?" I, I'll never forget. I, uh, you know, one of the things he said was, "I, I said, what do you, you know, what do you, what, what do you do for vocals?" He's like, I just record the, the mic. I'm like, you don't do any compression or anything. He's like, no. I'm like, really? He's like, well, and his reasoning is really sound. It's because I don't know what color I'm going to want in the mix. Mm-hmm. And I, I took that on. I don't, I generally, it will just be um, whatever microphone sounds best into whatever preamp sounds best. And, uh, Record it flat. Um, I give the I give the singer monitor side compression so that they get all that excitement and uh. all of that. And uh, but but then I have something that either I in a mix or a mixer, if someone else is going to mix, can can choose the color. What's a smart way to do what you're describing? Do we need to have a console and like splitters and? outboard compressor to go to the singer or can we maybe do some of this even if we're recording in, in Pro Tools for example? Well, I, I I don't know how you'd do it if you were on a native system. I, so I can't speak for that. But and like the, if, And why would why would that be challenging? Well, because of the latency, right? Um, in other words, yeah. if, you put a, if you put a plug in on the vocal chain, there'd it's going to sound like a latency. There'd be latency. Happens. But I guess what you could do is if you had if you had like an HD native system, you could come out of one of the outputs, like you, rec- you know, you set up your input, record it, and have the output of that go to an external compressor to the On headphone, the way out there, right? Ones, yeah. Yeah. Um, but if you have a, if you have a HD system, um, not the native, what do they call it? HDX system, you can just literally pop a plug in on it. A TDM plug yeah, in, yeah. Yeah, t- yeah. yeah, those have low latency. And then yeah. I, I think, I believe like, UAD and and mm-hmm. uh, maybe some others have sort of like uh, and I think um, even Presonus might have it for some of their fat channel plugins. Yeah, at sort sort of at the interface stage yes. where it's very very low latency. Yes, yes. But does that? I don't know if that prints it. it maybe you. I, I can't speak for all the variations, but you yeah. you may have choices and of how to do it. Alternately, you could if if you're on a if you're on a native system, you could technically split it. Right, so you you have your mic to the preamp, mult it. That may or may not be good depending on loads and you know impedances. Right, yeah. Um, it can but change the sound. It, it can change, but it. you could uh, or or even set up a second microphone, like a fifty-seven, and just crush the living crap out of that. Right, but then you're going to want to take that one into Pro Tools too, right? Well, yeah, <laughs> but uh, but that may become the sound. Yeah. That may become the sound. Um, what do you like to listen to in the control room if you're doing this kind of, um, I don't want to call it the safe way, but we'll call it like leaving lots of breathing room for the mix version of You mean what do vocal. I like to put on it? Well, do you put something on it so that it I makes do. more sense to you in the control room oh, or yeah, do you yeah, just yeah. leave it uncompressed? No, I, I generally generally will use distressors because they don't, 
you know, you don't have to use all that harmonic uh, stuff that they do. You can just use them as straight compressors and uh, probably double double compress it. Just catch the peaks, then kind of smooth it all out. But you're not committing that double compression no. to Pro Tools. No. You're doing that on the monitoring side. No. And again, I should say, this, it really depends on where it's going. Right. Like if I, if I know it's going to, you know, Chris Lord, I, I'm kind of, kind of get what I want. Otherwise, you know, I, I don't want the art going out of someone, out of my hands that much. Right, right. So. But if you're mixing it yourself, then you might leave yourself I'm, more. I would probably leave myself a lot more room. Yeah. yeah, it's fascinating. I remember when Brad Jones, my mentor at Alex the Great, once told me that he had started cutting vocals with just a mic pre straight in, no mm-hmm. compressor. And he was talking about the singer's experience. And I feel like on the singer's end, you do that. It, it you actually gives them room to sort of turn the vocal up really loud in the mix, too. Well, I guess if they're hearing it with the compression on, like you described, that's but, different. Well, it, but... The the good thing about um, doing it with no compression is that they're not getting a, um, you know, because obviously you're changing attacks and releases. So their their sustain or how they approach something is going to radically change if you've compressed the hell out of it. Plain, you know, that's that's my, that at least the people that I work with, you know, that's kind of, you know, yeah, and you work with a lot of great singers. There's a lot of um, wonderful uh, female singers that you've worked with, yeah. too. Um, I got three right here. Uh, Cheryl Crow, Liz Fair, and Macy Gray. Yeah. Um, do you want to share any stories about working with them? <laughs> uh, An awesome group of people. They're just awesome people. Yeah, I don't, I don't, know, what, I don't know what to say. Cher- Cheryl's lovely and one of the best singers I've ever worked with. What was the project that that uh, it was on her third record, The Globe Sessions, I think. Um, did some stuff on that with her, and then I subsequently um, did some work. Uh, she produced a Stevie Nicks record, oh, cool. and I did a I did a couple of songs, I think, on that. Uh, Sorry, I didn't her. put Stevie Nicks That's in your a, credit. Doesn't matter. <laughs> but and interestingly. I think we went through a bunch of mics and we ended up with that. You know the mic that she sings with Tom Petty, the 441? The the weird Oh, kind the of, Sennheiser? That's the mic we ended up using. The sort of square. Yeah. Looks like a... And she sounded great. She's it's like an original 421. Something like that, something yeah. Like that, right? Yeah. Silver. Yeah. Great, great microphones. Great Very microphones, cool. Yeah. So dynamic. So uh, maybe do talk a little bit about... The times when a dynamic mic can be the right choice for a vocal instead of a, you know a, a very very expensive condenser microphone. I mean, when you're looking at it, you're like, That's, "Well, this mic's worth thirty thousand right. dollars. Of course, we should use that." Versus, right. you know, the dynamic, which maybe is the like SM7, worth which works on everybody. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I I go back and forth with that because I again I. I uh, a lot of what we do is is a percentage. Um, so if it may sound better on the $30,000 48, 251 or whatever, but if uh, the singer isn't getting back what they are putting out, it's not worth it. Because I can always add some top end. I can always do something. Oh, perfect. This is a perfect story. Um, she may not be on your list. Uh, Worked with Anita Baker. Wow. Um, who, anybody that grew up kind of, you know, in the 80s knows an amazing singer, just crazy amazing singer. Was doing a record with her. Don Wallace was producing. We were at, uh, I th- was it, I th- I, it's Ocean Way. It's, I think it's United. It's United now or United Western. Whatever, I think that's what it's called now. And we had, gone through I and no joke probably about 15 20 microphones and this is it's not like this studio has like the best of the best microphones and she was not happy she just wasn't happy so so I said to her I said you know and he is so what makes you happy she's like I just don't sound how I sound when I'm on stage and I'm like okay well what do you use on stage 
and she's she's like, I use this microphone. I think it was a Beta 58, the one with the blue ring around mm-hmm. it yeah. and the whole thing. Uh, she didn't know that offhand, obviously, but she she found out from her sound guy. We found five Beta 58s and had her sing on five different ones. Again, we're we're at, you know, it's the room that like, you know, Jack Joseph Puig had forever. So it's yeah, beautiful, beautiful focus, spot. right? All these beautiful, you know, 1073s, all this gear and everything. It was a Beta 58 through the Avalon M5. <laughs> and that was the vocal sound. And she was super happy. And you know what? She was right. She was right. It sounded the best on on her voice. And those five Beta 58s, what's the process of, Listening to five beta fifty eights look like, uh, you know, you put them up in a line and have her sing and just let her pick which one she let likes. her pick which one she likes yeah. at that point. Yeah, because those are those. Uh, at least I couldn't hear any difference. I'll be honest and say say that. Um, but she chose the one that made her happy. You know what it feels like when inspiration hits and you want to capture your great song idea, but then the studio gets in the way and it's just no fun anymore. Wouldn't it feel awesome if you could simplify the process of producing new music from inspiration to final masterpiece? PreSona Studio One is a powerful digital audio workstation that helps you compose your music with a complete collection of virtual instruments for keyboards and drums, MIDI tools for hip hop, EDM, and film, a flexible sketch pad with chord charts and key recognition for songwriting and arranging, and classic effects pedals and amp simulators for guitar and bass. With 37 high-quality effects plugins, integrated Melodyne, and drag and drop flexibility, you can easily edit and polish your mixes. And Studio One is the only DAW with a built-in mastering studio so that you can take your record from writing to radio ready all in one place. Download your free version of Studio One Prime and get started now at PreSona wherever sound takes you. If you want to capture every nuance of a great performance in your studio, then you're going to need to start with a microphone that is crafted with great care and attention to detail. Jay-Z Mics and Riga Latvia designs amazing sounding microphones that are handcrafted with jeweler's precision to bring you incredible detail in your recordings. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design, which uses a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity while avoiding distracting colorations and distortions. This is my voice right now on the new Amethyst microphone. With Class A discrete amplifier circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and advanced built-in shock mount technology to bring an expensive sound to your studio for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the U.S., and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, you can use the coupon code ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the Amethyst microphone at jayzmic.com. You know, there again, there there's a, certainly a psychological element to making music and making art, and mm-hmm. it kind of may not matter whether there was any science to the difference between the five mics if the artist felt like choosing one Absolutely. was empowering, then that's a win. Absolutely. We're service business, service industry. It's whatever it takes to make them happy. Are there often opportunities to shoot out vocal mics going into a record to find out which one to use? And do you have any thoughts on, you know, ways that are good to do that or ways that are like, no, that's way too complicated? Uh, You know, again, these days, not too many. Um, It depends on the artist a lot of times. A lot of times, at at this stage of the game, I kind of have an overall idea of what I think will work for certain voices and certain things or certain people. and generally, you know, if I'm over at Blackbird or whatever, we'll just set up three, three or four microphones and just do a verse chorus into each. And then we just sit there. It's like, well, which one do we like? Yeah. You know, flat, of course, no compression, no EQ, right. nothing, just that into the mic pre. And then again, of course, you get into, well, which mic pre do you use? Right. Right. <laughs> and that's, that's the thing. You have to be consistent. So it has to be the same mic pre. It can't be can't be a different 1073 because you know it'll be different 
Yeah, yeah. indeed. Well, you mean like even using different ones on the console? Uh, yeah, you can't use a different one. It's got to be the same exact channel. Yeah. So whatever your channel path is, it's got to be the same exact thing. Yeah. yeah. It goes a little something like this. Mute, pull the patch, move it over to the next one, unmute. Exactly. If you forget to mute, yeah, then you, you have get a, a little loud and nasty in the headphones, issues, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, I will say, having done a bunch of that myself, that uh, we need to remember that sometimes the the phantom power warm up time on a microphone takes a moment too. Absolutely, you plug in a new condenser mic if it's if it's taken phantom, it could take a moment to actually get also, up to speed. The phantom power itself is makes a difference. I would have never thought this doing this record and we were using board phantom and it was like man the, some of the, you know a couple of the microphones just don't sound right it's like well lucky enough to have those standalone phantom power boxes plugged it up it's all of a sudden pff, sounds there you know just wasn't getting really, the right voltage to it, it, or it it's crazy how much power actually because you just don't think you just oh turn on a light switch or turn on this or that. It's like if if your power is just slightly low or slightly, it's going to change things in weird ways. So you need to check out. We all need to check out. There's a box from a St. Louis company called Locomotive Audio, and um, he made uh, this really cool. F- it's an outboard piece of gear, and it's nothing but dedicated to phantom power. And oh, wow. you can select and you can vary the phantom power on a mic while you're listening to it, and it completely changes the tone wow. and the characteristic of the mic. It's a trip. Um, wow. I'll have, to, I'll have to, you know, get more info on, on yeah. that. Yeah. We did an Instagram TV video about that last summer, um, and uh, just cool. And it's, it's a great reminder. I remember hearing Jakir King once talk about um, flipping phase on a microphone, and he's like, he pointed out, he's like, it sounds different depending on where you flip it. He said, believe it or not, listen to it. It's going to sound different if you flip the mic going into the mic pre or if you flip mm-hmm. the mic pre going into the compressor or the compressor going into Pro Tools. And I was yep. like, wow, really? All those places, yeah. a lot of variations. Yeah. And it's crazy sometimes even if you have like a, a lot of times I'll even just flip, like if, I, you know, if I'm mixing something, I'll just flip like the vocal. Even though it's not, there's not like two microphones or anything. But if, sometimes if you flip the vocal or you flip the phase on a mono instrument, it will make it sit differently in a mix. It's a, it's, phase is a pretty powerful thing. It makes sense. I mean, the, yeah. the waveform is uh, doing the opposite of what mm-hmm. it was a moment ago. Yeah. You know, from the, the moment of attack right up through the big yep. uh, fundamental of whatever that sound is. Yeah. Um, and then I remember discovering... As I, I actually got a mic back from the shop and I put the headphones on and I was listening to it and it didn't sound right. And then I flipped the phase on it. Or no, I think I was listening to it in figure eight. It was my U67. And I said something into the front and then I said something in the back and I was like, uh-oh, the back's messed up until I realized, no, it's just reverse phase in the headphones. Mm-hmm. It sounds different. Yeah, yeah. So I've learned to, um, you know, check the phase on the vocal mic to see which one sounds better in the headphones right. too. yeah. And also, you know, when you mic, if you do any of that kind of figure eight stuff with uh, with drums, sometimes putting the back towards the front is better. Makes it because sound you better. wanted the phase to well, be you, different. Or you or get a di- to- yeah, it's just different tonally. Um, I forget. There's like some reason for that. There's some electrical reason for that. I think Steve actually talked. Albini talks about that. He probably did. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a lot easier to hit the phase button than it is to run out and flip the mics around. Though <laughs> I will say that. Um, Kill It Kid. Yeah. Great sounding records. Yeah. Um, you know, we did talk about vocals and I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit more about like recording powerful, recording and mixing powerful vocals like his Mm -hmm. on that record. Uh, and then also talking about the drums. So maybe, maybe if there's anything to say about the Kill It Kid vocals, maybe share that. And then let's talk more about, um, drums. You know, how do you get, uh, Really punchy, quick drums like the Kill It Kid record. Um, and also, you know, what are some fun ways to mic up the drums that we might have forgotten to try? Okay, so the first, so recording that kind of a vocalist, somebody that's really dynamic like that. Um, well, for me, I know on that particular record, I don't know, a few things, uh, other things I've worked on, like Jennifer Nettles is one of those people. It's like, 
I ride the input a lot to Pro Tools. So like if they're singing something really soft, you know, I push it up. And this is without the compression on there again? This is without compression. Now, that, again, that's not to say, I with those particular people, I may have like some sort of opto, something super slow attack, super fast release, just to protect me. Um, but clean, nothing that's adding harmonic kind of color to it. Um, and definitely nothing that's going more than 3 dB of compression. And that overall. is going into, pro, being that's, captured into Pro Tools that with, would with be, a little compression. Yeah, because I, I just have to be careful because, you know, you just don't know. Um, so I would, it would be, I think with Chris, we did a 251 um, into API. It, it was the, it was the API, no. Well, this was at, Gar this was at Gary's Place, House of Blues in, in LA. Um, so I think he may have had the Neve at this point. So it would have been into his, the Neve that he had there, uh, fader out into the, uh, the compressor, and then the compressor feeds uh, Pro Tools. So I would just ride the vocal, um, you know, into it to kind of keep levels kind of consistent. Um, that's really, I mean, other than that, it's just paying attention to make sure that they don't blow up the actual uh, capsule. Because those types of singers, right? right? So um, too much power on a capsule much, starts to get crunchy, strident. Almost. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's something that that's kind of an art form that's been lost a bit. I think the working the microphone thing. A lot of singers. That's why dynamics work really well, right? Because you don't really have to worry too much about blowing mm -hmm. up the capsules. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's that. Um, it's a good reminder that vocals are one of the most dynamic instruments crazy, we ever right? record on, on yeah. a microphone. Absolutely. Crazy dynamic. Um, and then drums, I mean, I, do you want me to talk specifically about those? or? Uh, yeah, why don't you talk about those drums? Because I, I actually described them as quick drums. And I, I apologize, I didn't write down the which song it was, because there's a lot of great sounding Kill the Kid songs in yeah, the tracks. Yeah, they're, they're, they're amazing. Um, um, here, let me see if I can pull that up. But it was, uh, it was just, I think it was Caroline. Mm -hmm. Maybe just very, they're like, they're in and out of the way. Right. You know? Uh, I do know it was an immaculately tuned kit we got from Big John in LA. I wish I could remember his <laughs> nice, name. That's great. Big John. I love it. Big John. Um, drums, the most important thing, and Nashville's fantastic for it because you have Paulie. Um, and I know the, the other guys over at Drum, Drum, Par is it Drum, Drum Paradise. Drum yeah. Paradise. Just tell here. us who Polly is. I don't know Paul. Well, Polly's the Blackbird. Oh, uh, yeah, great. He, he, you know, he runs the whole kind of show over there, but uh, he'll set up like, you know, if, if I tell him I want like whatever, 1960s, you know, whatever, he's like, oh, yeah, I've got this Rogers kit and I've got this and I've got this. And I'm like, oh, well, what about if we do Vista Lights? And yeah, I got that. And he sets it up. He's like, okay, so what kind of sound are you looking for? And we go through it. If, if there's anything I could ever tell anybody as, a, as an engineer coming up, find someone that knows how to tune drums. That, like, I, I can't even begin to tell you how it's just, it, it saves everything. It really, really does. Because um, if you have a great tuned kick, great tuned snare, great tuned toms, that's next to the, and I'm taking out the human playing it. That's literally 95% of the engineering side of it. What about the beater on the kick drum? How important is that? And how often do you swap that out with a different one? Depend, again, it's so song dependent. So it just depends on the song. If, it's, if I'm getting too much click or too much attack, obviously we go with something a little bit softer, a little bit, you know, the felt or whatever. And, you know, if I want more attack, flip it around. Go to, go to the plastic. Um, or just, I'll go and move the microphones. I don't, I can't think of a record that I haven't gone out on every song and tweak the drums a little bit. Yeah. You know, the overheads may generally stay where they are and the, obviously the room mics, but like snares and kick drums, the, those little inches make a, make a huge, huge difference um, for everything. 
Be a little more specific. So uh, if we're talking about the kick, what inches are we talking about here? How many mics might we might we be faced with on the kick drum? And what are we doing as far as moving those mics around? Depends on the... Uh, <laughs> I'm getting a smile and a nod for that one. No, that's but, all right. You just make something up. No, pick no, pick but, any but, one of them. No, but here's the thing. It's like if I was doing... Um, if I do a rock record, generally it'll be... You know, a mic that's just kind of sort of inside the kick drum and then something that's outside. And I may have a room mic that is primarily the low, what, what I call the low end of the kit, mm-hmm. maybe about, you know, five to 10 feet away. And we might or might not have a front head on the kick drum too. I like, fun, I like heads. Okay. I'm not a huge fan of taking, the, uh, taking it off. But again, it depends on the song. Um, but if I'm doing, like you brought it up, that like that Van Hunt record, um, I used a D30 for the kick drum, and that's it. Um, so it kind of you know it kind of depends, and then you, that and that was a, a, a drum head off. That was the the, the drum head off kind of kind of vibe we were looking for. Yeah. Um, so th- those tend to be very quick. Yeah. Almost like pillowy. They're or very very pill- They're beautiful. They're Beatles. It's yeah. the, the Beatles kind of. Tone, but Kill It Kid, Smashing Pumpkins, thinking about like big rock band, mm-hmm. kick drums. Um, you know the the one inside that that gives you some beater control. The one outside gives you some of that low end control. Some of the low end control. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, generally, I mean, mic wise, it's the inside mic can either be like a four two one, at twenty five, uh, or a d d one twelve. Um, outside mic, it's almost always a 47 FET. Almost right, always. Right. Though for lo- the longest time, um, and I learned this from Flood, was 47 inside, literally three or four inches off the beater. Right. And it's, you know, it's not great for your 47, but... It's a rock sound for sure. 47 is just a badass mic. It's a badass microphone, yeah. Maybe um, be a little more specific about what makes the 47 so versatile in that way. And and it's a loaded mm. question. Yeah. So I noticed, I remember the first time I used it, discovering it's like, oh, it's got a pad on it, but it's also got like, it's got an input pad and an output pad. Right. Well, obviously to stop you from blowing up the input. Right? It's like a capsule. It's a pad just for the capsule, yeah. and then it's a pad for the output of for the, the microphone, output, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, they're just great. Mi- I mean, those those micro they just they get enough of the low end without getting too woomphy, and they give you enough of that high end and kind of mid range kind of area, um, which is actually what I'm looking for a lot of times is kind of that. <sighs> 350 to kind of like 800 mm-hmm. kind of range. I kind of like my kick drums to have a bit of that meat, that gut to it. Because you're almost always, you know, for rock and roll at least, you're almost always like somewhere around 250, 270, you're pulling out. Scooping it out. Scooping right? a bunch out. Um, and Why do you think that is? I, I don't know. Why, because, why, because, why does something exist that needs to be scooped out? Well, and, and what's interesting is, is if you do the same thing for an R&B record, it's the wrong thing to do. Right, so like if I'm doing, you know, like the like Dap King records or things like that, that those records are really kind of beefy in that range, and it's cool and it works for that type of stuff. You know, it gives you that kind of old school kind of hump. There's it kind of sucks when you're doing a session like a Dap King's thing and you're getting these rock drum sounds and it's just not working. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely done that. Like, but I got my punchy beater and my deep low end. Trust me, I've done done that quite a bit myself. (laughs) Yeah. During the height of record making, Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stax Studios, Ardent Studios, and the New York City Record Plant all turned to one company to build their consoles. That company is now Spectra 1964, carried on today through Bill Cheney and Jim Romney. The extremely stable, high-speed circuit design of the 101 amplifier provides unequaled headroom, low noise, and linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks, giving you cleaner, punchier, 
dynamic recordings. Spectra 1964 brings you the sound of ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, King Crimson, John Lennon, and so many more. Created by the missile engineers who are central in rolling out the systems that protected the free world for over half a century, Spectra 1964 literally brings rocket science to your studio. With the STX 600 mic pre with built-in comp limiter, full frequency passive BBDI, and C610 dedicated comp limiter, start making records that last a lifetime at spectra1964.com. All right, let me ask you a, a classic question. Talk a little bit about the relationship between bass and kick drum and what makes sense or, or you know, the, the ways in which those relationships are totally different in different styles of songs. Hmm. Well, I'll talk about how, what I like. Cool. Which, which kind of, and then we can, we can go off from there. Um, I tend to like my bass to always sit below my kick drum. Um, and I think that's mainly a function of the music that I liked, you know, kind of growing up. I kind of like that Motown stacks kind of vibe and it was always like a you know really heavy lower bass and then the kick drum is like little pops and you know quick quick and short right it, yeah it's that kind of thing and can i ask how low is low when we think about that bass i mean are we still needing to roll some of it off or does it like extend all the way to the bottom kind of thing for me it kind of extends all the way to the bottom though i will do kind of like a what is, is it a high low cut I always get these mixed up. Yeah, yeah, they never fix that for uh, us, dude. High yeah. pass, low cut. I, I will low cut uh, somewhere around 30 to 35, like a 6 or 12 dB slope, depending on what's going on. But there's almost always a bump at 40. Um, and then what... It, and again, it, it depends on the key of the song and everything. But, you, you know, you just find kind of where the harmonics are. So, you know, for certain songs, it may be 40, it may be 60, it may be 80. And then you just find the harmonics from there and kind of you know, push them up or pull them down, depending on what's going on. And finding the harmonics translates to, it sounds good. <laughs> well, for uh, those of well, us. <laughs> no, but like, <laughs> so, so, you know, you know, so like if you, it, 40, then, then the, the next harmonic would be 80. Right. Then there's 160, which is, you almost always want to kind of kill, right? Because it's almost always too much uh, with the bass. Then you have 320. Wait, which one was it that we want to kill? Uh, I find I always want to kill around 160. Okay, take it. I find, I, because you know why? Because my kick drums are in that 100 range. So like the, the slope of it, it's eating into like my, the upper part of my kick drum. So Rockstars, if you want to compete with Howard and go for a totally new sound, just start boosting 160. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But 160, you know, that 160, 140, 180 works really well for the low end of the snare. Right. That's the you know? chest. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times I'll just automate EQ, you know, to come in with those hits. What does that mean? Well, you know, because like if you have a, if you have a snare drum and if you've recorded it, obviously if you've recorded it, you're going to have hi-hat in it. You're going to have a little bit of kick drum, blah, 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 all of that kind of stuff. Even if you gate it out, you're still going to have these spills or whatever. But, you know, in, in the effort to, to kind of make everything as punchy as possible, I may just go in and just automate. Because if you hit a kick drum and a snare together, you're going to get more low end, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, I may have to go in and automate an EQ curve in there to kind of give me the same kind of, like, <sighs> kind of chesty punch for everything. So in other words, if the beat involves a kick and a snare on one beat, and then on the next beat, it just involves a snare, the one with just the snare might need that extra boost. Exactly. Only in that moment. Only in that moment. So we're talking about like a very sculpted, automated boost yeah. of just the low end right yeah. during the, you know, drawn in just for the, yeah. the snare hit in Pro Tools, for example. Yeah. Do you use um, Pro Tools' new uh, clip EQ? feature where you can like carve out that clip and just just boost that one clip for the low end. Wait, what's this? Ah, it's been I guess it's been around for a minute, but um you you know you can add processing just to a clip. Oh, just to, oh, yeah, the, the clip. So you have to like right. cut it out first right. and well, process it differently. 
Wouldn't you, but it would have to be super on the grid. Uh, I think you just have to cut cut out the snare start and end. You know, oh, I see. You I see what you're saying. I've I have used that, not in that capacity though. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I guess you could do that. I just use um, Feb Filter. Yeah, because it's it's awesome. And just drawing a, an automation line. Yeah, it's awesome. Cool. Yeah, that's a great tip, man. And it's just a reminder too, the level of detail and care that can go into getting the sound right by mm-hmm. the time you're done. I mean that. We have to car- give ourselves another 30 minutes to 60 minutes to go through the song and add those curves. You to know each what? Hit. I, uh, one thing Stuff I right? do want to say is like we've, we've gotten into a, uh, an engineering culture, let's call it, of let's try to get it done as fast as possible. Um, and I didn't come up in that world. And that's not to say that sometimes you got to bang it out and you got to get it done or whatever. But all I know is, is if somebody gives me their art, their baby, I'm, I'm going to try to make that baby grow. I'm, not, I'm, gonna, I'm going to spend as much time as I need to make it great. So if, it, if, it, if that means the song only takes two hours, that's great. But if the song takes 24 hours, then that's what the song needs. You know, I... It, if somebody hands me 10 songs to mix and they say, how long do you need to mix it? I can't say, oh, only 10 days. It may take 20 days. You know, some t- I, we've all gotten into that funk where it's like all of a sudden nothing sounds good. And it's like, okay, I got to go back to the first one again. Um, you know, so I just think take your time with a lot of these things. It's not a race. It really isn't. It isn't a race to finish these, yeah, these things. It's a, I was always struck by how... Um, there was urgency to deadlines in the music industry, and it seems like none of them were ever true. Never, <laughs> never. And there's a lot of guys that have that badge of honor of like, oh, I can finish the song in an hour. And it's like, well, that's, that's good for them. And, and I, I'm not dissing them or taking anything away from them. That's their bag, and that's what they do. But for me, I, yeah. need, I, I like to take the time. For you, that's not my bag, baby. Right, that's not my bag. <laughs> um, okay, well, how do you know when a mix is done? How do you know it's when never done. the thing that you're working on is done? <laughs> oh. It's never done. It's never done. I, I, it's funny. It's I, never done, but it's always done right. I did this, I did this record, um, this Glenn Campbell record a few years ago, and uh, we didn't print stems. Uh, and so they contacted me uh, a couple of weeks ago to like, uh, can you make stems? I'm like, well, yeah, but essentially I'm remixing the song. It's not just, it's not as simple as just because it, it was done on a console and the whole thing. And so like, and I'm listening to the old mix and I'm like, man, this mix sucks. And like the new mix, I'm like, wow, this mix sounds amazing. It, it sounds so much better. It's fuller, it's wider, it's the whole thing. But you know what? And I think this is a Clear Mountain quote. Nobody ever... Like, liked or didn't like a record because of the snare sound. Right, right. Right? So, you know, at the end of the day, every, everything's important, but nothing's important. So it's kind of a, the Buddhist kind of thing. Maybe it was like Bruce Wadeen who said, like, nobody ever leaves the record store humming the sound of the console. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, right? But true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I'm I'm always struck by that too. You listen to hit songs that you know are great songs, and they've mm-hmm. stuck with you. And you go back and listen to them, and you're like, it "Sounds like shit." You ma- like I started imagining, like, okay, what do I, I want to imagine stripping the vocal away and just having the track behind it? What does it sound like? And what would I have thought if I was working on it? And would I be done with it? Yeah. If I was working on it, and a lot of times I'm like, it doesn't sound anything like I thought it sounded yeah. like. But I mean, also, you know, you think about the impression, like impression is a very big part of it. Like everybody, like Back in Black is a perfect example. Yeah. Everybody thinks it's like this massive heavy record and you put it on against anything today and it's like, it's like a toy. Right. Right. It sounds small in comparison, but the impression it makes is so much bigger, mm. you know, because it, there's so much space around it. It's so much heavier because of, because of that, you know. And Great the, songs. And then there was well. Hell's Bells. And then there was Hell's Bells. Um, awesome, dude. 
Uh, what else should we keep talking about? I mean, there's so much cool stuff you've done. Um, another artist you work with is Vintage Trouble. Mm -hmm. Run Like the River. I, it starts out with this really big, wide slide guitar thing that's nice and big and sounds awesome. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about that. I mean, we've already talked about guitars. Um, so I don't even know what question to ask. Tell us about working with Vintage Trouble. All right. Well, um, Wow. Uh, I got a call um, with, uh, and at the time I was doing a lot of records with Don Waz and he called me up and he's like, Howie, got a record, you know, to do. And I was like, I was just about to start working with the Pumpkins. And so we kind of worked out timelines and uh, went to LA and spent six, six weeks, about six weeks in uh, United, I think it's United now. So, and we were in, no, it's uh, East West. And we were in Studio Two, which is Jim Scott's old room. Amazing, oh, amazing cool. studio. It's, uh, it's one of the best as well. I mean, LA has great studios, uh, but that, that's a great room. Super dead, you know, really dry kind yeah. of room. And Don wanted to do this thing where he wanted to record the band live. And anybody that knows that room is, knows it's not, it's not small, but it's also not big. Um, but we set the, facing away from the control room, we set them up in a line. So we had drums in the center, bass off to one side, and guitar player off to the other. And we had uh, Ty, the vocalist, actually in the vocal booth. Um, and we set up so many microphones. Like, it, it was awesome. It was so, it was so awesome. But we spent, you know, Don was really good about, let's just get my, everything to sound cool. Um, and we cut, we cut all that stuff live. You know, there's, there's some minimal overdubs, um, but even the vocals for the most part are first take. So guitar, bass, drums mm -hmm. are all in a parallel line, or, or they're on, on the same plane. On the same plane. It live in the same room. It live in the same so room. So there's bleed. Bleed everywhere. Bleed everywhere. Uh, and we would have room mics. You know, I had far room mics to capture the whole thing. And then I would have a room mic that was, you know, for maybe the guitar or a room mic that was for the the, uh, the drums and a room mic that was for, for, the, for the bass. Um, and it's amazing how little bleed there is in all of that stuff. It's mm. there, but it's not unworkable right? kind of stuff. Right. Um, I feel yeah. like when you start to learn about bleed and you start to learn about putting instruments together in the same room, you begin to learn that it has everything to do with the relative volumes of the instruments to yeah. each other. And when they're matching, when they're appropriately matching, then yeah. you can solo them and it makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah. And all those... All those classic records that we love. It's all nothing but room lead in right. all those microphones. Right. Um, those two room mics that are seeing the whole band, mm -hmm. what would they sound like if you just bit. soloed them? Um, does it sound like a pretty cool mix of the band or does it sound like automatically a little too far away? It its sounds own? like a distant, like if you were, you know, at a concert, maybe, you know, back a bit. Okay. Like, you know, there's there's obviously a low end build up, um, you know, maybe a bit too much of that lower mid kind of thing. But again, it's not anything that's unworkable, right? Um, and luckily, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think it who makes that record? Oh, he's an amazing mixer too. English guy did the Adele stuff. Uh, oh, uh, uh, I believe uh, I believe it was Tom Elm Elmhurst that okay. makes that record. Okay, um, and so. Was there something about the way he mixed in the room mics that? Well, the, the it's the the interesting thing is, is when you listen to the record, it's it's live without being roomy, like whatever he did in in the mix is. It's it's and it it it's something that I've, I'm I'm still learning, but like the great mixers really do this, and Clear Mountain's another one that does this. Is like if I hand something over to somebody like that. They take what you have and they, they 
it's an, it's an extension of what you have. It's not a replacement of what you have. Right. Which is the, the thing I really don't like is when you hand it over to someone, it's like immediately, well, your kick is gone. Your snare's replaced. This is happening. I'm not listening to any of this stuff. It's like, well, there's a reason why we sat for, you know, four weeks and chose this and this is why it sounds this way. That's not to say that you shouldn't supplement. I just have an issue with people that immediately dismiss the work you've done. Maybe in the face of efficiency or speed. In the face, yeah. And again, it's, we all do our own thing and that's, that's cool. And I guess if you're going to that type of mixer, you're going to them for that kind of thing. Um, but, but Tom and, and Bob, they, they just took, they took stuff that was re- well recorded and just made it sound, it, it sounded like I didn't record it. Like, I don't even know how to explain it. They made it sound like Al Schmidt recorded it. Right. Right. Yeah. Like it, it just sounded beautiful. It just sounded beautiful. And you know, that's, that's what I, anyway, I don't know. I don't know where well, yeah, we're I going with we, that, but. No, we all <clears throat> understand. I mean, any of us who've ever had somebody else mix something and go, how the hell did they yeah. do that? I've certainly had that experience. I think I've quit beating myself up for it. Yeah. Sort of give myself a little more credit for if I put in the time and effort to make something really well, I'll do a pretty good job with it. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, I, you know, it's encouraging to be reminded that even. You know, even you feel that way. We all feel that way. It's like a- all the time. It's it's the, that's the hardest thing I think about what we do is like you you sit there and you beat yourself up for this stuff, and it's like you know, don't yeah, don't. It's this is where you're at in your journey. Well, let me jump into some of our closing questions here and um, kind of get all you know um, uh, feel. Uh, I guess these are our like touchy feely questions. No, I don't know what they are. <laughs> um, when you started out, but they're they're you know sort of philosophical questions. Some of them anyway. Um, when you started out in recording, what do you feel like was holding you back? Probably um, empathy or lack of. Interesting. I think you know with youth comes the beautiful thing about youth is. You want to the, the the easy the easy way to say it is you want to blow shit up, right? You, you want to make your mark. You want to make your mark, and you don't. It's not that you don't care how you do it. You just you just do it in a way that's really sometimes can be very uncool, right? Um, and um, it 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 took a couple of years to kind of understand that it wasn't. Um, wasn't about me, I guess, you know? I think I, you have to understand that these artists are on their own journey, you know? It's, it's their path, and it's whether you like it or not, it's, it's what they ultimately, they have to live with it for the rest of their lives. You, you're done with it, depending on the record, in, you know, two weeks or, you know, six months, and you're kind of done. And the path of a young artist may be completely different from the path of an experienced absolutely a veteran artist absolutely yeah it's it's a uh, it's that reading the room kind of thing right it's like that leads to another thing of like what what else you could do like one of your questions it's it's like i i wish i knew back then how to read the room better yeah let's say yeah I was going to jump in and make a joke about how it's taken me at least five years to learn that this podcast is not about me. And as I was thinking about it, I was like, dude, you just made it about you by throwing a joke in there. (laughs) (laughs) But it is about you. This is is your spot, man. Well, man, I'm just honored to be able to do this. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a Nashville session drummer and a Grammy-winning studio. Want to start mastering your own records? Rockstars of Mastering walks you through exactly how I mastered my own record using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. Want to learn how to create a mix that doesn't suck but rocks instead? At Mix Master Bundle, I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins so that you can have punchy, powerful 
drums, guitars that rock, bass you can feel, and a mix that is in your face. Plus, it's totally free as my way of saying thanks for listening. Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes below. How about some of the best advice you received in the studio? Or for making records? Best advice? Um... I don't get, know if it was advice. Get this lunch order right. <laughs> yeah, well, Jesus. Back then, man, that was the biggest thing. Like, if because if you could do that, then they know they knew that they could trust you with some of the other things. That's a big, you know what? That is a big one. That is a big one. I, 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 the, the forest for the trees is kind of like knowing that it's not about the lunch order. It's about whether or not you can operate, you know, and come up to a level. That, that needs are you to be, a team player? Are you a team player? Yeah. Because again, it, it's, not, it's not about you. I guess the, the best piece of advice I got is not necessarily advice, but it was like kind of a, kind of a truism, I guess. And it was um, working with Chad Blake. Um, and I turned to him. We were eating, we were eating lunch and uh, I turned and I said, you know, Chad, what, what did you do? You know, how did you, basically, how did you get to where you're going? And he, he just said, you know, I didn't change anything. People just finally came around to me. Interesting. And that's paraphrasing a bit. And, uh, you know, I think that's the thing. It's like, you know, he, he's obviously on a different, a different path. He's kind of more of, you, you know, you're going to get something kind of, crunchy and weird if you go to Chad, right? You're going to get that cool Arctic Monkeys or, you know, Los Lobos kind of yeah. kind of vibe if you go to him. Colossal um, Head was one of my favorites. Great, right? Um, but uh, I think it's, you know, kind of make your own mark. Yeah, and it's an interesting thing that people finally just came around to me. That makes me think of the value of taking the risk to put yourself out there. If you put yourself out there enough times... Mm-hmm. You at least give people a chance to come around to you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, it's, you know, just don't get discouraged. You know, a lot of the stuff I do and, you know, can I'll bring it back to working with Billy a bit is like, he'll say, do X, Y, Z, right? And a lot of times it's, as we've talked, it's impressionistic. So there's no, it's not really do this. It's, you have this really super wide palette to do anything, but you're in this sandbox, right? So let's, I'll do a bunch of stuff and he'll hate most of it, you know, or not like it, or it won't be in the sandbox that it's supposed to be in. Can I ask you a question about mm-hmm. that? What is a valuable way? I don't want to put anybody on the spot here, but what is a valuable way in that he's able to communicate to you that he hates something and you are like, I'm so glad you communicated that to me that way. Uh, I guess I've been in situations where the band was like, that sucks. Right. And I learned to actually love that because I was like, great. It means sure. I can stop working on that and we'll go try something else. Sure. Um, but well, it, could turn, it could turn you off at first. It, you know what I mean? It can turn you off. I think, you know, again, the thing that comes with... Uh, experience is that I, I don't take it, per, I don't take any of this personally. It, this is what I think. And if it, if it doesn't fit into your aesthetic, um, that's okay. Then, then you're right. Then you're right. <laughs> right. Just like I'm right. You know, cause I, you know, a lot of, a lot of times it'll be something like, well, you know, Howard do this, blah, blah, blah. You know, do something like, you know, maybe just a quick, different mix, like a different mix perspective or something like that. And, and it'll be like, no, that's, it sounds way too much like something that's super modern. And that's not what you're trying to do, right? And he'll say, I don't like that, but I understand that. I understand what you're going for. So let's try to break it down and approach it from kind of like wh- something that I understand. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah, I, you can keep elaborating if you want. Well, but. I think, you know, artists, like, we're, we're all kind of this, we're all different. 
and and I know that's a really simplistic way of saying something, but like, just because my impression, say, of 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 a guitar tone may not be anywhere near what your impression of a guitar tone is. Right. It's all subjective, right? I may think a great guitar tone is, you know, whatever. and But yours may be, oh, well, it's this Rush song from, you know, right. Fly By Night, blah, 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 kind of thing. Um, so, so my go-to as a producer or an engineer or a mixer may, will always tend towards the things that I like, right? His is his or theirs, the artist is going to tend towards something else. So you've got to learn to play kind of like in their impressionistic sandbox. Right. Not so much they have to play in mine, you have to play in theirs. And it in no way invalidates your sandbox. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It actually makes it better because it, it gives you a broader palette to yeah. play with. You know, it really does. Mark mm -hmm. Ronson's great at that type of stuff. Like his productions, um, you know, super modern yet retro-y, right? Yeah. Because um, you can clearly tell what he likes, you know? Um, and that's his kind of sandbox, but somebody else does and it kind of sounds, well, it just sounds like a cheap knockoff. Right. Right? Oh, man. Yeah. Which brings up the, you know, the tough question of how do you find your voice? How do you find your voice so you're not doing a cheap knockoff of somebody else, but you're doing a... Hundred yeah. percent genuine, Howard Willing. Um, is that a question? <laughs> I don't know. I just made it up. It's my new question. How do we find I, our voice in what I, we do? I think you just have to be true to yourself. You know, I, it's for lack of a better word, being cheesy isn't bad, and also being super eclectic isn't bad. You know. Yeah. I and I happen to be. I like both a lot. I love super pop, you know, immediate songs. And I also love, you know, Dark Side of the Moon, man. You know, <laughs> right? I, you know, all of that type of Come stuff. Come on, man. Who doesn't like Dark Side? I was just listening to it again. <laughs> it's brilliant. That stuff's brilliant. It is it's brilliant. so good. Do you know here in Nashville at the Science Center, they still do like, Three different Pink Floyd laser shows the in a row the, every Saturday night. I think oh, I didn't it is, know or that. Something like that, or pretty pretty close to it. Yeah. Wow. You can go see Dark Side of the Moon start to finish Get laser baked, show man. in the planetarium, <laughs> planetarium <laughs> and bring your vape thingy. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. All right, um, wonderful. So you you uh, here's a couple that are a little geekier, um, mm -hmm. not about recording, but um, you know, do you have any tips for the rock stars about the business side of making records, if they want to do this for more than just a hobby, have you got any advice? Whether it's, you know, some cool online tool or whether it's just how to manage things, whatever you want to say. Don't go into debt. That's the best piece of advice I can ever give anybody is just don't go into debt. There's enough, there's enough stuff out there. Like even... Don't don't go into debt for school. Don't go in like just just don't do it because there's enough information out there, and enough people want to help. You were telling me you just called up Steve Albini one day to ask him a question. Yeah. Like if you can get a, if you can get a hold of somebody like that, you can get a hold of almost anybody. And I know I've had people reach out to me via email, say how do you blah 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 or you know do this, and I I answer. You know, I I don't I. It's a community for us, but don't don't go into debt. Just don't get hung up on the Instagram guy that has three hundred thousand dollars worth of gear but no records. You know, because I know it depresses me sometimes when I see that. Because I'm like, well, I've done all of this and I I don't have <laughs> I don't have an SSL in my house. I always felt like those were the dentist guitar rigs, you know, yeah. the doctor the doctor rigs. Yeah. Be like, man, what they, how did they afford that fifty thousand dollars Stratocaster? Crazy. Um, okay, cool. So, going not going into debt is great. Um, I suppose it's a reminder that you can uh, make a lot of records with inexpensive mics until you can afford absolutely save up your cash to get the expensive mics. Yeah, and and then the other thing is, you know, 
we're lucky enough. We live in Nashville, so we can go down to like uh, uh, Vintage King or some of these other places where you can actually, they'll actually let you sit there and listen to gear. Um, uh, this is going to come out wrong, but I'm just going to say it. Um, don't ask people that don't know what gear you should buy. There's certain, you know, online forums um, and certain things. Just don't ask them. For me, it was almost always the salesman at the music store. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just don't, because because again, what works for what works for someone else won't may not work for you. I mean, there's certain truisms. 1073s, you know, API, uh, you know, there's certain things that are, they're just going to work. But if you keep it in that, you're, you're going you're gonna to be okay. But just don't, yeah. Uh, just a reminder yeah. uh, to rock stars that as far as uh, being in a place where you can't go to a vintage king and go listen to some stuff, you can go to a website, a new one called Audio Test Kitchen, and actually listen to some pa- comparisons of different microphones. Yeah. And that can be uh, pretty cool to hear. Yeah. Um, although I also like the non-scientific approach to comparing things where it's like, if I can just hear one version of somebody using something and it sounds great, I'm like, that sounds good for me. <laughs> you know? There's there's definitely that, yeah. I just think, you know, you, you there's a lot of this kind of boutique engineer gear out there. And a lot of it's great. But then you also see a lot of it on reverb. You mean that are, people are getting rid of people are getting rid of interesting yeah um, so I, I I think you know you you've got to you've got to learn to listen to gear and not to people's opinions yeah um, well I guess it's also a reminder that you can always get something and if it doesn't work for you return it return or sell it yeah. or sell it later, later. Um, what about the um, you know the the process of knowing what does sound good. In my experience, it always boils down to actually hearing things side by side until you're like, oh, I like this one better. It's kind of like listening to the different tape formulations. Well, it, yeah, exactly. And, and that's kind of like what, where I'm coming from with um, don't, I'm not saying don't trust online, you know, uh, uh, people. What I'm saying is you, you've, you've got to actually listen to stuff. Right. And so like if a lot of times I'll see, you know, what do you guys think about, you know, um, Compressor X versus compressor Y. And you'll have, you know, 10 people say, well, compressor X is the one to get. And it's like, well, but you're not even taking into account what style of music this person does. Yeah. You know, their workflow or anything like that. Yeah. Compressor Y may be the correct choice for them. Or maybe no compressor. Maybe it's, they need to change out a, a microphone. Maybe that's you know, where or the, money, the band. In front or of the, the band, microphone. yeah, for that matter. Yeah, now I've been doing this long enough to discover that what some people think is just awesome, I think sounds like shit. And what I think is just awesome, other people think sounds like shit. Yeah. And that's what makes this world of music interesting. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I 100% agree with that. Um, let me go to a closing question here and ask you, this one's hypothetical, but we're going to take the Wayback Studio Machine and go back and find okay. young Howard who's uh, maybe going into school, maybe coming out of school. I don't know. Maybe you're just, um, you know, sick of buying saxophone reeds at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going to find yourself and say, listen, dude, I've come all the way back from the future. And first of all, you're lucky. You're still going to have this much hair on your head. So you don't <laughs> have to worry going. about that. It's going, man. <laughs> but second of all, um, I want to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you like to go back and give yourself if you could? I actually knew, I know you were going to ask this question and I still couldn't figure out an answer for it. Um, it's because I'm so ridiculous. I throw you off track just with my question <laughs> asking. Um, I, say it one more time to me. What, what, is it, is what it, advice do you want to go what, back and give what, to your, what your younger self? advice do I give to myself? This, you know what, this is actually, this is more on the life side of things. This won't necessarily be an audio thing, but this came via a lot of therapy. and uh, Love therapy. I love it too. And this is, uh, 
my therapist, Harry, when he said this to me, it blew my mind. And I was probably 34, 35 at the time. Um, and he said, figure out where you're going, figure out who's going with you, and never get them in the wrong order. And Ooh, that's fascinating. And the brilliant thing about that is when you're young, you know, a lot of us are driven and everything like that, but and I, I see it a lot of times with, with young guys. It's like they have that, the girl, or there's the guy, you know, and everything, like that side of it is just falling apart. But that also makes your work side of things fall apart. And I think for driven people like us, you got to figure out how you're going to do this and why you're doing this. And then you'll find the right person to go along with you. Yeah. Wow. I certainly had to go through those struggles myself. Me too. Me too. It's, it's a rough one. And that's, that's probably the hardest thing about what we do. You know, as guys and girls, we, we burn through relationships quite a bit. Because not everybody understands 12 hours uh, working on- <laughs> not, everybody on, understands, on <laughs> not everybody understands 12 hours is a short day. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a short day. Like when people tell, oh yeah, I worked, I worked 40 hours this, this week. It's like, I'm already up to 96. What are, what are you talking about? I wouldn't know what to do with myself. You know, if I wasn't like, it's, I'm only having this conversation with you right now because we're working together. Exactly. At <laughs> it, I mean, it's it's. I, I love the fact that I get up every day at you know around six a.m. and I can literally go down my hallway, flip the computer on, and I can literally start work and ha and do a lot of times. We'll start working super early in the morning because you hear things totally differently. You know, and you need someone. Or you don't need someone, but you need to be around people that understand that about you, you know? Yeah. Sometimes I feel guilty about not doing my, you know, like morning meditation and, you know, free writing or whatever mm -hmm. first thing when I go hit the studio. But um, I do really like getting up super early and just going straight into the Isn't studio. It, it's the best. It and really one is. One of my faves is those days where you might wake up at like four in the morning and you can't sleep and you're like, you know what? I'm just going to go do an overdub. It's awesome. It's awesome. I can't turn up the, my monitors because, you know, it's, uh, it's part of my house. So I just, I'll do it on headphones and stuff like that. And all of a sudden it's like the sun's come up and like, yeah. uh, oh, oh, there's a cup of coffee already ready for me. It's like, oh. You know. And you didn't even make the coffee? You didn't make the coffee. Yeah. Your, your partner made the coffee for you. Because you found the right one. You found the right one. Yeah. Awesome, dude. Well, thank you so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with uh, us. Um, this is too short. It's been two hours already and it's too short. Uh -huh. Uh, I love talking to you, dude. It's been an absolute blast it's a to pleasure. meet you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for taking time out. I know you've been very busy, and we're just lucky to like get a window here so close to the holidays and everything. Even yes. though I'm dating this, when this comes out, it won't be the holiday. It'll be new, a new holiday. <laughs> um, but uh, let the rock stars know how they can find you online. Where would you like them to go to learn more about you? You do have a very cool website. Is it? My, my I think so. Yeah, my, you're my very, girl. My girl put that together. For oh, me. it's great. Yeah, she, she's. She's a goofball. She's good. No, it's great I, stuff. I, like I mean, you, you sort of self-admittedly um, aren't, you know, you're not writing big bios and stuff. No. Um, but I like the way your website's just like, hey, check out the work I've done. And, yeah. I, was, and I saw it and I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can find me just uh, howardwilling.com. Uh, and I'm on Instagram. Just Howard Willing. I think a bear pops up or something like that. But, oh, right. Don't yeah. poke the bear. Don't poke right? the bear, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> Well, dude, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, we look forward to seeing you again. And um, Rockstars, thanks for listening. Reminder that we've got some great uh, videos in a playlist for you waiting in the show notes. So please click through and go uh, straight to the blog post to go get all that stuff. And you can go listen to all these records we're talking about. And um, just can't wait to see you again, man. Thanks for having me. All right, dude, cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my 
free course at MixMasterBundle.com. And if you want more free content from recording studio rock stars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio. Just look for the link in the show notes below. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rock Stars. Now, go make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Whisper Room, Spectra 1964, PreSonus Studio One, Jay-Z Microphones, United Plugins, bringing you Hyperspace, Royal Compressor, Fire Cobra, and Front Daw, and Audio Movers, helping stream high-quality audio directly from your studio. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. So thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you guys in the next episode.